Welcome to the first in a series of CAPS Conversations to promote dialogue and growth for those of us engaged as mental health practitioners of all sorts. I'm Gwen White. I serve as the board chair of CAPS International. The Christian Association for Psychological Studies seeks to be a vibrant community that encourages in-depth conversation and consideration of therapeutic and theoretical research, of practice in counseling and psychotherapy, as well as with theological issues. Today's conversation that you're about to view continues this mission to explore the issues of our day. Thanks for joining us in this virtual format. To begin, I hope you'll forgive me. I'm going to read some remarks as we get started. Some of them my friend Rochelle helped me write. You'll meet Rochelle in just a few minutes. I want to stay on script with these details before we begin our conversation, so I don't miss anything here at the start. First, I'd like to mention that the CAPS 2021 conference is coming up in March. At the time that we are filming this today, we are still planning an in-person conference in Louisville, Kentucky in March of 2021. We hope you'll consider joining us. Although by the time you're watching this, we may have decided that it was necessary to move our conference to a virtual format. If so, you'll hear about that too. We hope you'll come and uh, join in, in our community and in our conversation. I'd also like to announce an exciting program that CAPS is launching this fall, the McNeil Scholars Project. Planning for this new project began over 18 months ago but its launch this fall seems particularly important as our nation reckons with the realities and damage of systemic racism. The McNeil Scholars Project is a two-year mentoring program for doctoral students of color. You can learn more about this project at caps.net. I really hope you'll check that out. Today's conversation is about race and psychotherapy. As a white therapist in Philadelphia for over 20 years, I've struggled to understand the role race plays in my interactions with my many African American clients and colleagues. Today, I've invited three of my friends and colleagues to join me for a frank conversation about this difficult topic. Before we begin with the introductions of my friends, I want to say something briefly about my misgivings as we enter this conversation. It's a difficult subject. In this country, we're all immersed in the system of white supremacy from the time we're born. Unlearning the ideas and beliefs that stem from that system takes a sustained effort over time. So much is unconscious. Conversations like this one can be helpful, particularly to white therapists, as black therapists try to describe their experience as we try to talk to one another. Conversations with black people can be a part of the process for white clinicians to understand racism, but only a part. There's much learning that needs to happen by those of us who are white and who wear our privilege so easily. When asking a black family member, friend, or colleague for help, we must be prepared for the range of responses we might receive. And we must be prepared to respect the individual's right to choose if and how they want to engage with us around this topic. Each African American person will have a unique view regarding the extent to which they want to assume a teaching or enlightening posture with white people. This view may vary depending on the relationship you have and on personal experiences of both parties. It's not the job of Blacks to undo a system of white supremacy. Today's conversation is an exercise in grace because of this, at least as I see it, as my Black friends speak about their experience as therapists. So it's with much gratitude that I introduce you to my colleagues. Dr. Algernon Baker has PhD in Marriage and Family Therapy. Dr. Rochelle Grady has her doctorate of arts in also marriage and family therapy. And Dr. Akuya Opoku-Watten has her PhD in marriage and family therapy. 
Thanks for joining me in this conversation today. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So let's dive right in. Don't want to waste any time. How do you see race impacting your work? Well, I think race um, impacts my work in so many different ways. Um, I think that there are two ways that I think of within myself and then also within my clients. Uh, it, it can't help but really um, impact the way that I, I behave, the attitudes that I have around the world, my worldview. Um, and so in behavior, I believe that it um, conceptualizes how I see conflict, how I express different things in my body language and the language that I use, how I problem solve, and then also in the attitudes that I have. There can be culturally specific things that I think about as far as expression, um, how someone might raise a child, or um, the role of a partner, or the way that we even learn concepts. Race is saturated in everything that I do. And so I have to be careful of that as well in my, in my work. Um, it also can be an advantage in my work. And so how I might bring it up with clients or how I might talk about race with my clients is to normalize things that they might experience. If I'm working with a black client and they're experiencing racism on their job, I can personally identify with that. And so it, it does give me advantage and uh, benefit in the way that I might be able to identify with that experience with them, again, normalize it for them, and then also even put that in context of the psychology of that client, how that might impact their attachment style or how that might impact the way that they pursue relationships in the future. And so race is, is a part of everything that I do. Mm -hmm. um, Part of how I see the world. It's a part of how I might even conceptualize myself as a practitioner in this field. And so I um, do my best to um, normalize it for myself, um, put myself in places where race is celebrated and my race is um, welcomed in order for me to be able to feel more empowered to do the things that I do on a daily basis. Mm. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about how when I first started as a clinician, uh, most of my clients were white clients and I had some reservations about, not, not so much about me serving them, but how they would feel about having a black therapist. Now, I'm, I'm much more uh, relaxed, I think, because many of my clients are, are African-American black people. And one of the first things they say to me, in fact, the client said the other day, I'm so glad you're a black man. And I said, so am I. <laughs> and I knew what she meant because most, most of the women, the black women that call me are calling because they believe I'll connect with their black partner. And um, so that's one of the ways race in, in, in impacts my work. I see, and I'm happy to see because of the stigma that exists in our community around mental health help seeking. I, I'm glad to be a part of the stigmatizing uh, mental illness and mental health help seeking. I absolutely agree. I think as a private practice clinician, um, Clients are seeking me out oftentimes specifically because I'm a woman of color and they want that comfort when they come in to speak with their therapist. And even though the black community is not monolithic, I think there's some common threads that run through our experience that clients can trust that they don't have to explain every detail of their experience or that we're going to have some common thread that runs through all of our experience. And I think that's very comforting to clients to know that when they come through the door. I was also reflecting that it affects the business side of private practice because in the world that we live in, social media, our pictures are out on the internet. They're part of our Psychology Today profile. Um, they're on the practice website. So I think that clients who come to me in private practice know ahead of time that I'm a woman of color. So if they're not a person of color, I think that they're already have a level of comfort with working with a clinician of color or else they would make a different choice. Yeah, I think that's really true. I know uh, in my experience, since I refer to you all rather regularly, and I know I'm referring some white people along with, of course, a, a whole host of folks with various backgrounds. Uh, 
I do pause. I, I think I've gotten better at it and, and y'all have helped me get better at this, but there is this sense that is this person going to react negatively? Um, mm. And uh, I've just kind of gotten to the place where I say, well, we, we have that sense too. And so <laughs> I've, I've wondered with clients that terminate early that may come for a session or two, if that was, a, if that was a component of, of why they decided to discontinue therapy with me. Yeah. And sometimes I guess we know that and sometimes we won't. Right, exactly. Yeah. Well, and being able to accept that it's not my fault necessarily. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, and how we discern those as we keep trying to learn from our errors, right? Yep. <laughs> and yet not, yeah, that, that's a very complex moment, isn't it? Yeah. Well, let me push in on this a little bit. Do you code switch with white clients? Absolutely. I code switch in the world when I'm, when I'm not among my people. It's something we learn very early, early on to, um, to make sure that our vowel sounds, you know, are just right, that all the consonants are just right, and um, the grammar, all of it. And it's interesting, my children have remarked that they may hear me on the phone with one person, and then I may call a friend, and it's like listening to two different people. And um, part of that means I, I, I'm not uh, sort of giving in or trying to be white as a lot of people might, might term it, but I want to um, be accepted. That's really the bottom line of it. I want to be accepted. I want to validate my education on some level and uh, all of those kinds of things. I think most, well, maybe many black clients, we find uh, uh, therapists, we find ourselves doing this in the world just generally. And certainly when I talk to a white client, I'm aware of it. And as I'm, as I become more comfortable, I think I may, ch I may change and relax a little bit, but up front, it absolutely happens. Whether I want to or not, often I can hear it while I'm talking and I'm thinking, dude, you don't really talk like this. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something we just are accustomed to. Yeah. So would the inverse be true if you have a black client, your language shifts to what is more comfortable for you, more natural? I think so, because as they are, as they're being themselves and they're talking in black vernacular, there's a lot of language that perhaps a, a, a different therapist, a non-black therapist would have to ask about or try to interpret through context what a word may or a phrase might mean. And uh, part of the beauty, is, as Michelle was saying earlier, is that when, when they come in, there's a sense that they can breathe and they can relax and they can be themselves. And I want that. And I don't want them to experience me in, in you know, that language that I use or the version of language that I use uh, professionally. I don't want them to think that that's a barrier between us. So I'm, I, I am my very self with those clients. And uh, it, it's a little easier. And of course, you know, they may know that I'm code switching, but wonder, why are you doing that with me? Talk like you really talk, you know, do, mm -hmm. do your thing. Say, I want to hear, I want to hear my voice in your mouth, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, that um, just the, the, the phrases that you use, the, the um, even even some of the pop culture things that they may may reference that I know about, right? That is a part of our community that I can say, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes, I saw I actually saw that last night, you know. Um, and so it really creates a, a level of comfort that, oh, you see me, you understand me, right? And so yes, we can jump into the most dear and private parts of my life because we're on a similar page starting off. A lot of clients come to me and say, I worked with, or clients of color will come to me and say, I've worked with a white therapist mm -hmm. and I felt like I had to explain everything. Like it took me a while just to explain what I was saying in order to get and start the work of understanding myself, <laughs> right? And so it was kind of like double work that they were doing, which felt um, challenging because that happens in the world every day. We have to explain our hair or explain what we're wearing or explain the way that we might um, say a phrase or express ourselves. And so it can be really 
comforting to be in a space where I can literally just be myself and do the, the matters in the business of psychological work. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Um, I agree that code switching, I think it just becomes so much a part of who you are as a person of color. I think especially in your educational world and in your professional world, if you're moving in spaces that are either all white or primarily white, it's really a skill you have to have to succeed. Um, so I don't think I even consciously code switch. It's just so much a part of who I am. And I think even with clients of color, before you get to that, I'm going to be more relaxed and use a different type of language. I think there's even still a sense that I need to present myself as someone who is professional and well educated in my craft um, and knows what I'm doing. And then we can move into that more comfortable um, way of speaking. So you would start even with a black client at what you're calling a more I, I don't know what to call it, a professional level, but you would move into language that might be more familiar to the client as you've built the alliance. Is, am I following you correctly? I think so, because I think especially in those early sessions, you're, supposed, you're trying to help a client to feel comfortable and to build that therapeutic rapport, but you're also trying to convey that you have expertise and knowledge. So I think it's a balancing act in the beginning. Um, either way, though, I think that however I'm showing up with uh, white clients or my clients of color, it still feels very authentic to me. And I don't know if that's a byproduct of having done code switching throughout a lifetime. Interesting. So, Richelle, tell us a little more than given, gosh, the political context, the recent protests, um, all of the conversation that's going on nationally right right now. Um, how does that impact your work as a therapist of color? Yeah, I think one thing that's been interesting for all clinicians during this time of the pandemic is that we're having this parallel process with our clients in terms of anxiety and uncertainty about what's happening in the world. And for me, as the protests started and I started to think more deeply about race, it really intensified um, that experience of the parallel process. So with my clients of color, they wanted to process what was happening in the world and how they were feeling unsafe or worried or concerned. So I'm holding space for those clients and talking with them, but I'm also experiencing my own racial trauma. I'm thinking about what I've seen in the news, how I feel about that how I'm feeling about raising my three black sons in this world that maybe at one point I thought was maybe more um, had advanced to a certain level and now I'm saying no things haven't changed as much as I hoped that they would. So we're both having the client and myself having this experience together and it was also interesting that without exception all of my white clients also wanted to process the moment but they were coming from different places. Some had already been doing anti-racism work and consider themselves allies. So we're talking um, from that perspective. But I also had clients that were just waking up to the reality of race in this country. Um, so again, that idea of holding space for people coming from these different places while I'm also experiencing my own trauma in the moment. Um, so I think that was really pushing me more to really pay attention to my self-care, um, to do things that helped me feel grounded and proud of my community. I spent time visiting other therapists of color websites and seeing good work that they were doing um, and immersing myself in that type of input so that I could feel grounded and prepared to show up for clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. I, I think that um, this has been a unique experience, um, 2020, I think for all of us, but particularly as it pertains to um, race and my race, I think it has been um, kind of walking around with no skin, it feels like. Mm -hmm. Just extremely um, sensitive time, holding space for 
multiple experiences, whether it be a, a black client that needs to just weep and cry and lament and feel broken. And I'm feeling that too. I'm feeling every bit of that too and trying to hold that frame, you know, can, sometimes can be shaky. Um, or again, a, a white client that is so enraged um, that their parents do not understand and agree and or feel it too and why and are waking up to the rage um, that James Baldwin talked about that is our experience every day and having to hold space for this new rage. Uh, and then also uh, another experience of a person that does not get it at all, and does not see why, why this would be happening or why are people doing this and, and holding that space too, all while experiencing the rage my, my, in my own life. Um, and so it, it, it was really, really, really challenging. I think probably more challenging than anything I've experienced in, in my career. Um, and so paying attention to my own racial trauma, I think was it important and pivotal, being able to up my self-care, but then also just the community care. We surround each other with love and support when we are feeling a communal or and or family, really, we see it as a family tragedy. Um, and so really attending to those spaces of support um, of people that look like me that can say, yep. And literally, that's it. <laughs> and they, you know, it can feel exactly, uh, I don't have to use words, uh, you know, you know, or we just, just the word, girl. Whew you know, um, and, and being able to unconsciously connect and, and make space for sorrow and pain in the way that I think we have historically done. Um, that was life changing for me. It's, it's really strange to, to, to sit in a room and I, I, I hear you, Aquia, you know, just say, girl, listen, you know, and just sort of shaking your head because, you, you know, we know what's happening. And um, for that first couple of weeks with all the protests, sitting with, with my Black clients who were sad and angry and filled with hate and, um, and resentful and all of the emotions that you might express. And I'm sitting there inside thinking, I totally get it. I get the fear. I get the anger. I get, the, I get it all. It, it makes sense. And how does this how is this impacting who you are as a person, how you're showing up in your family? And then also being mindful of how I'm showing up in my own family with my sons and my daughter and what, what, what lessons are they learning by watching me and hearing me talk about my frustration with what's happening in Washington and, and around the country. And um, part of the frustration has to do with, many of us have been doing this work for a long time. So it's shocking to see white people wake up you know, I'm thinking it's 2020, you guys should have been well, 50 years ago or 20 years ago. And for me, waking up myself, I heard a sermon at the very beginning of the pandemic that challenged me because I had laid the work down. I just stopped because I was sick of educating white people. Don't ask me a question. Don't ask me how I'm doing. Don't ask me to speak for black people. Let's just, you know, let's talk about whatever we're here to talk about and leave that alone. And I just stopped, I just stopped doing the work. I just disconnected, but this, this latest incident um, and feeling my responsibility to speak up and say something about it, re it's re-engaged me. And I'm ashamed to say, you know, honestly, when President Trump got elected, I thought, oh, this is the America my parents said existed. So mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm gonna take care of my people. And that's, that's where I am. And I, I'm ashamed to say that, but that's where I was and that's what I thought. But now noticing I've got to re-engage, I've got to be present um, for, my, for, my, for my clients as well as, as for my family. The other interesting thing was processing this with white men, and I see several, and it's strange, it's almost as if they forget that I'm a black man and not just their therapist. So they're talking about all of the statistics of police shootings and almost as if to say it's not that bad, you know, White, white people get shot more than black people get shot. And my sense of rage, I want to just come out of my chair sometimes. 
But, and I said to one client, you do realize that you're speaking to a black man, right? I'm, I'm your therapist. And I don't know if I broke the frame or not. I'm not sure I care that much. But I, I, when he's, I wanted to make him aware that this is, you know, you sit there with your st statistics, but I sit here with my experience. Mm -hmm. So which one is more valid, right? So the, it's a good one. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Algernon. Did you want to... No, I was just going to say, in that moment, I wanted to make him aware of my personhood. And I think that was what was challenging. It was almost as if he was just talking to me and I, I, I shouldn't say anything. anything. I, was, I, I was disempowered, you know, mm -hmm. to say yes. anything. And I thought, well, let that's... me just and, and um, say something about this. Yeah. Well, and isn't that a tough, a, that's a dilemma in the therapeutic frame so clearly right. yeah but what do you do yeah. it causes me to wonder what about microaggressions in sessions what do you what do you do do you address these directly or not i mean i think that's the question that your experience is posing for all of us here I, i'm wondering as a white therapist you know i i have clients that express obviously their reactions to what's happening around them and i've really struggled to sort through i mean i think part of my job as a therapist is to help my clients deal with reality now that's a big big giant thing right and so as I want to help them understand their internal patterns and how that shapes how they even view reality, how they make meaning, and then how they decide to behave in the world. So when a client speaks to me about what's happening in their world, and it has to do with race, and they say something bigoted, there I am in that moment trying to sort out which way I go, which choice do I make clinically to, you know, I, and I often feel empowered, I think, in those moments. I certainly pray in the silence of my own mind for clarity and guidance and just the right words. But, but I find that I'm, I'm, trying to keep my own emotions calm, but then I'm also trying to help that client begin to connect these patterns, perhaps this unconscious aggression with the other and the way that they are looking at the world, making meaning of who others are and mm -hmm. whole huge process of otherizing of making the stranger, and certainly not responding in any Christian fashion to the stranger who we're clearly commanded and welcome. So anyway, uh, that, that's my side of this. Let me throw it back to you guys. What do you do with microaggressions? Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. No, I was saying, I, I, I correct them. If there's a microaggression, there's a micro intervention. And I'll go as I'll go as deeply as, as they go and just make a slight correction. And it's not I'm hoping I'm hoping it's not offensive. But uh, I, I think being trained in systems has made me really aware of 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 some of those the, the necessary corrections, because mm -hmm. that world that worldview that can be bigoted or racist or in, insensitive or that, that seeks to steal dignity from other people is a part of what might be a systemic issue in their world. And if I can help to correct that, then I'm doing, um, I'm in some way allowing my activism to assist them even in, in, in helping to uh, change their psyche and their, their worldview. Yeah, Algernon, if I could jump in a minute, can I press you a little bit on that? What kind of language? Yeah. Can you tell us what you might actually say? I know I'm, that's kind of putting you on the spot. Uh, when, I, when I hear people say things like the Blacks. Okay. I say, you mean, you mean Black people. Oh, okay. <laughs> and it's, oh yeah, Black people, you know, because that language is offensive to a lot of us, the Blacks, you know. So it might be something like that. I yeah. see. So you really try to pace yourself with the client. You're really working. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, because I don't want to. I don't want them to be, you know, burdened with this, you know, me lambast masking them about something that they said, you know, very slightly. But I do want to make the correction and make them aware that there's another way to to say a particular thing that's less offensive to me and to others. I, so as a therapist, I don't want to feel like I have to be offended and just sort of take it in order to continue to do good work. If there's something that's said, I want to say something about it. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I can't help but smile <laughs> when I'm listening um, to and talk about that because that's happened so many times, right? Um, it, it really depends on the microaggression. Sometimes it can be pretty macro, <laughs> just straight up. <laughs> Um, and then sometimes it's micro. So if, it, if it's micro for me, you know, sometimes I actually may not address it. Um, again, some of these things happen so commonly. And um, if I think that it's an oversight or ignorance of the client, I may, I may not necessarily say something about it. Um, again, if they try to, you know, ask me about some pop culture thing that they think I should know about because I'm black and I say, I, I, I'm not sure. I don't, I, I didn't see that. Um, you know, I may not go into why I didn't see it and like, you know, <laughs> all of that. I'll just kind of let that go. Or um, sometimes I'll have clients that try to, um, um, they want, you know, in some way they want me to be the cool person, right? That they kind of, they're stroking that part of the thread, like, you know, you're cool. And so they might say, you know, white client might say, girl, you know, and, you know, start talking to me that way. And, you know, in some way, I, I find myself straightening up and saying, no, <laughs> um, that, that's not that's not necessarily how you how you address me. Um, and that's not something I would say directly. Um, I just change my posture and change the way I perceive that. There are moments where I hear bigoted language straight up, you know, just racist language. And, and in some way, I. Um, kind of perk up in my humanity and get really, really gentle with the client and try to help them see how the other person might experience something, right? If, if a person um, in session might say, you know, you know, those, those people, it's like, yeah, they are people. I wonder about, I wonder about what does that mean that they're people and with feelings and thoughts and experiences. That's good. Wonder what those people feel, you know, um, and, and in some way there is a humanity that is being called in the moment, that is being elevated in the moment, that is a part, and I think the most important part of anti-racist work is to humanize the black person and to um, create equality in the way that we just see a person. Um, and that is, the, that is really the start of it. I've had, in, in my experience, I worked in other, other areas which were quite rural, <laughs> rural Alabama actually. And I've had people call me colored, right? Um, who are you here to see? Oh, the little colored girl. I'm here to see, see the colored girl. And, and in some way, you know, depending on who the person was, it was an older lady in her 70s, you know, that was her most treasured way of being kind to me based on her generation and her frame of reference. <laughs> Literally, you know, um, that was the most appropriate thing to say in her day, <laughs> right? And so that, that's not something that I correct. I do say, I do rec help her recognize that I'm not a little girl, right? Um, because that's also a microaggression that I would be little or that I would be less than, or I would be a girl in some way. So, you know, it's just the way that it, it really fits the client and in the situation. I definitely agree with that. I feel like now I have some new language. Maybe I've been doing micro interventions and not <laughs> realizing it <laughs> all along. Um, but I think for me, it really depends on what I know of the client and where I understand them to be coming from. Sometimes people are speaking out of ignorance. Um, so it might be a simple uh, correction of language where you don't spend a lot of time. Um, but sometimes if it's a larger um, 
offense, I think I try to dig into what's going on with that person, how they're feeling about it. Um, and to me, a lot of times with clients, what comes up are issues of fear and safety. So maybe being able to turn the conversation around from maybe it's not about this group of people, but about this other thing. And I think that's been powerful for some clients. I also think that maybe, um, again, because of who I attract as a clinician, I'm not experiencing a lot of microaggression in sessions. Um, early in my career, I worked in rural Western Pennsylvania. Um, there was an active Klan presence. I did in-home counseling. And there, I just experienced blatant racism um, on a pretty regular basis. Um, so I think how I practice now maybe um, changes the type of client interactions that I have. Mm. Mm. So let, let's kind of migrate. I think we're still on the, the same page here, but, but maybe talk a little more about your experience um, with racial trauma and countertransference. I know, Aquia, you really spoke to this poignantly. Um, but I'm just wondering if there's, there's more to say about, about racial stress and trauma in all of this. Uh, Algernon, you want to jump in here and get us going? I think as, as um, Rochelle and Aquila were, were talking out, I started to think, I wonder, do Black therapists burn out more quickly because of this emotional labor that's on top of all of the other stuff that, that we're dealing with? And I don't know that white, white therapists are dealing with the same kinds of things, not that they're not dealing with other things, but the things that we're talking about adds another layer of work. Uh, on, on to what to what we do, the the counter transference when uh, you know gentrifiers are realizing that you know people in in our neighborhoods get shot. There is violence. There is police brutality, and there are protests frequently. Hearing them say, you know, basically, I got to get out of this neighborhood, and I'm thinking to myself, what? Well, wait, you chose to live here because you, you know this is where you want it to be. And now you realize that you're in the ghetto and you want to leave. And so those are things that inside, I know that's not them, that's me uh, and, and, and my judgment. So I talked with my, with my supervisor frequently about these things because I know it's not, it's not them. That's my react. That's my counter transference. And uh, in terms of the racial trauma, as Aquila was saying earlier, when there are things that happen, when, when a black man gets shot by the police on television, the policeman isn't arrested or, um, or brought to any type of accountability for his actions, that is frustrating. So I, I come to work with that. I, um, it's with me all day long. And I'm, I'm hyper vigilant when I go to my car at night and I, I have other, other things that I'm thinking about. In addition to the work of therapy, but I have to, of course, keep that in check and make sure, okay, is this, is this something I'm feeling? Is this my, my counter-transference or is this something different? And so I'm always aware that that's happening and also aware that um, I'm not unaffected as a black man who's, you know, a certain weight and uh, six feet tall and how I'm perceived in the world. And even when I come into my office, I'm still often perceived in, in the same sort of way. So. I think there is an extra sensitivity to to what I'm feeling and making sure I don't have that proverbial chip, you know, on my on my shoulder. Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It does. I'm also thinking about uh, the question you posed: Are black therapists burning out faster? And I'm just thinking it's not just in the work where we're carrying that extra emotional pull. It's just as we move through the world as people of color. And I think I'm finding myself especially aware of that during this time. In terms of my own counter-transference, I found that my feelings were coming up most strongly when I was talking with other clients of color that maybe had internalized racism and were speaking um, from that perspective. And I felt like that really brought up a lot for me, not wanting them to uh, have that view of themselves or having adopted um, the view of white supremacy. So I found that's where I struggled the most over the past couple of months. 
Yes. I guess I was, I was going to say, I added a couple things here. Um, that I, I posted the other day, um, seeing black people die on camera is not normal. We have in, in some way normalized, mm -hmm. um, sometimes even become desensitized mm -hmm. to what is, is really modern day lynchings. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the psychological toll that that takes I think on a person in general to see a human life taken away, but then also that that human life looks like you mm -hmm. and actually could be you mm -hmm. is a collective sorrow and trauma that oftentimes we do not recognize even in ourselves because it is so often and so normalized today. And so I've had to really, um, give myself lots of space because it was it was typical in the community when someone was lynched there was the day after even sometimes the week after the community would be in a collective sorrow space mm -hmm. right that it would it would linger in the space it would linger in the village it would linger in the community and so the day that the day after or the day that someone gets shot and you see a black person that you're working with and you walk past them and you say, hi, how are you doing? And talking about the weekend, we are holding sorrow and trauma. Mm -hmm. We are holding all of the things that have happened within the community. And in some way, there's still an expectation that we might be acceptable, that we might hold space for people. Yeah. that we might hear the story about the weekend about the golf trip about the whatever it is <laughs> right in the lunchroom that we would just move forward and so as far as counter transference for me i have allowed myself to not just move forward hmm. that there is sorrow yes there's going to be sorrow this week hmm. because of jacob blake there's going to be sorrow ah. this week because of the things that we've experienced and so let that be, let it linger. Yeah, that's great. And so it, I'm, I want to understand better. I think both Rochelle and Aquia, you both mentioned sort of checking off when a client out of ignorance says something. Ignorance seems to me to be a big enemy here. And, and maybe I'm not thinking about it correctly, but that ignorance and, and sort of the system's ability to excuse particular kind of ignorance, that seems part of this, big part of this. And so I'm, I, I just want you to talk a little bit about that, but the, the, the lady in her 70s somehow how do, what do we do, right? Because yes, it's, it's her generation, but it's wrong. And I hear you ready to let that go by. It's admirable. And yet part of me wants to know, well, how do we, how do we address ignorance? Aljan, you were chuckling as I was trying to get at whatever this thing is in my head. Well, I'm, I'm, ch I'm chuckling because Aquia and, and Rochelle are just so gracious and sweet. Yes, they <laughs> are. Yes. That's, that's, yeah. um, I, I think, I think historic, we have to talk about the history, right? Because this, this is important in, in, how, in understanding how we might even come to this, this um, response, right? That, um, to correct a, a, a white person historically yeah. could end in a situation like Emmett Till. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. And so there has been a generation upon generation of a narrative that has been passed down that we hold fast to, which is we need to keep our security, whether that be our job, whether that be our reputation in the community whether that be uh, the ability to move forward in the system. And 
traditionally, it has not been acceptable for, um, and even to this day, right, that if there are moments where you see in a meeting where a, a Black person seeks to correct someone, um, the air changes and tilts a little bit, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. It's not as acceptable. Um, and so sometimes we're having to choose between dismantling a, a whole system of, of reputation and uh, accountability and um, just the tenderness of relationship with a person. We're having to either choose between that or being correct. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so, you know, what do we choose here, right? Because I can correct you and in some way that really does just crash the tower that we've just built, <laughs> right? Um, and so this is where in these moments, it, it becomes really, really helpful for um, white allies to jump in and to say no, <laughs> um, for allies to be able to change the narrative in, in that same story. I, I, what I didn't say is that the receptionist that was working for me at the time um, corrected her. Wow. Oh, nice. <laughs> right? Yeah. It was a white um and of course you know i smile and say yeah come on, come on back um but but what she did was she corrected her right yeah. so there will be moments where the correction is necessary i think in the climate where we are now the correction is more welcomed right okay. it's more welcomed yeah it's not completely yeah. welcome well i must um, see how welcome it is right <laughs> <laughs> no so um yeah, that, 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 I think that's a part of the process that, that it, it, we, have, we have come to this place for our own safety and livelihood. And so even in our work, there's an arc of, of being able to come outside of that shield in that, that place, place of armor to say, is it really okay? Can we really say what we really think? Yeah, that's helpful, thank you. I think that's a great point. I was also thinking about the idea of stereotypes, especially as women of color and um, the idea of the angry black woman or that you're defensive or are quick to get upset. And I think that plays into it as well as you're making those calculations about whether or not to address something. And Akwe, I really like the point about um, white allies doing some of that work because I think it will land differently. Um, coming from a white ally so yeah i think that's a really important point great so let me push us back to a topic that you've all mentioned and we didn't really talk much about you you said something about self-care sprinkled all through this can you say a little bit more about maybe what's helpful to you as therapists who are also persons of color? Um, I think moments, I talked a little bit about this before, but moments of pause, reflection, and just rest. There, there's a lot unconsciously, consciously, um, even neurologically that's going on in our bodies and we need moments of rest. Uh, there's a reason why you're so tired after all of those sessions. There's a reason why you may get up and feel like, oh my goodness, my body <laughs> is really hurting right now. What, what happened? Um, I feel like I just worked out. You really need a lot of rest when, when doing work, I think specifically during this time. And so I find myself taking moments of pause and reflection or that pause and reflection being a moment of sorrow just to take in the gravity of life that has been lost um, and the risk of life lost that I might be holding in that day. Um, I, I believe that the audacity of joy is a part of self-care and practice in this moment, right? That given all the things I think that, that Black people experience, the idea that there would be joy um, is in some way even rebellious <laughs> to the to the space, you know, to be able to laugh, to be able to have moments of bliss, it lifts your spirit and soul. I think that's a part of our community that we we will laugh. We could be at a funeral. We could be at you know wherever we are that is dripped in sorrow, and we can we can laugh and we can have um, joy that's that's mixed within that. 
and then split spaces where you're fully seen. Um, I think people will notice that I, I'm not talking about bubble baths and the massages right now because these things, this is deeper than that. Um, your actual self care is um, reliant on yourself being seen. Mm -hmm. And so spaces where you are seen, where a friend or a, a person that, that looks like you can look in your eyes and say, what's going on? I see it. What's up? It's okay. You could talk about it. Um, or a circle of safety uh, where, you know, people that you've known for some time can really put things into words that you have not been able to find language for. That is caring for the self, that is caring for the soul. And so in these moments, it's, it's more like soul healing um, than working out. But, you know, working out is helpful too. <laughs> um, stress relieving is, is also helpful. So all of those practices, but specifically for race uh, and racial trauma, those are things I found. One of the things I miss, honestly, is church. Oh. Church is so, it's always been a part in this country of, of the black experience. It was a place where if there was a lynching that week, we could come and we could sing and find joy and hug and comfort each other and be certain that in many cases, the preacher would talk about it and give voice to our, our, our hurt and our pain. And it's not the same virtual church. Those of us that are still attending, it's just not the same. It's, it's a production and you see the praise team and the lights and the smoke and the preachers doing his thing, but there is a component that's missing. You know, we have in, in a lot of our churches, we have times of, you know, fellowship in the middle of service, stand up and go and hug somebody, and greet somebody. And I miss that stuff. I miss, you know, looking in other people's faces and instead of just being a consumer of the church service, but being really actively involved, talking back to my preacher, singing with people on my pew next to me and feeling safe, feeling safe, feeling like this is my spot and I got to get up and I got to go back out there tomorrow. But for now, I'm with my family. They get me. My preacher's not trying to avoid these things that are really difficult. He or she is talking about them in a way that makes me feel like, okay, I can do this one more week. Or I, I can hold out until Bible study on Wednesday. And I think that's one of the things that, that for many of us is a, is a big part of our, of our, our self-care that's missing right now. Mm. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Even I do find myself talking back to the iPad uh, from my kitchen table <laughs> on Sunday morning. Yeah. Um, I think for me during this time, the checking in with self has become so urgent, like just having a sense of where I am emotionally at, at, at any given point or each day as I prepare to sit with clients. Um, Aquia mentioned holding space for sadness. I think um, by nature, I am a little mild mannered. I don't know how Algernon referred to it before, but also allowing myself space for anger because I'm angry. I'm angry about a lot of um, what I'm seeing in the world um, and just creating space for that, that I can be sad, um, that I can be angry and um, to treat self-care as if it's urgent because for me, I think at this time it is. And I think um, I mentioned earlier, a big piece that I've added to my self-care is being intentional about being in spaces where other um, Black therapists or Black women are talking and speaking about the work um, has been helpful. So, um, so what next in this big conversation about race and psychology. What, where do we need to go from here? Mm. I, I think, think part of it, Go ahead, Algernon. Uh, so I think part of it may be helping. Um, so here's what I've done. Here's what I decided to do when I sort of stepped back from the activism. I just developed a reading list. 
And so people that would be on my Facebook page, I would basically say, look, here's a reading list. When you read these books, you'll be educated enough to have a conversation with me. And I think we, we all need to, um, to read more and do our own work. In the spirit of what you introduced, Gwen, uh, in the very beginning about white people and white therapists doing their own work. And that's really important because a lot, of, a lot of black therapists who will come to you will need you to know certain things. They'll need you to have a certain humility and a certain um, confidence a, a, around race and, and, and other issues in the same way that you were trained, you know, in your one diversity class in your master's program or your doctoral program. It doesn't mean that you're actually ready to go out and to, and to manage clients who look like me. I'd want you to read certain things and, and to be aware of, um, of how you're gonna show up in this space without, without depending on black clients or, or other black therapists to inform you. I'd want you to do your own work. And I think there is something to be said around, especially those of us that are trained in systems, how, how will we maybe, I don't know if reinvent is the right word, but maybe tweak some of, our, our, um, some of the ways that we work because not all of the models that we use are for every culture. And I know that's a big debate in, in our fields right now, but the truth is there's some things that need to be tweaked. Every component of EFT may not work with every client. And, uh, and I'm, I'm experiencing that as a therapist who uses EFT, I, I have to think twice before I do everything that's recommended. And so being able to change and tweak certain things um, based on the client that you have, educating yourself and being humble in the space. And even though you may have the power in the room, being on some level still teachable. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I agree. I think in terms of um, moving even education forward, if we're not just having that one diversity class in a master's program and our doctoral program, but if we're talking about race and culture in each of the classes, how we're thinking about um, diagnosis, how we're thinking about um, the systems models that we've been taught, are they truly applicable across cultures? So having that a part of every conversation in every class. Um, I think I might also say something maybe a little more provocative, this idea that doing the, the anti-racism anti -racism work if you're a white therapist is essential if you're going to work with clients of color, color. I'm thinking about one of the things that we really prioritize as clinicians is not doing harm when people come into the therapy room. Um, but if you haven't done the work, you don't understand systemic racism and don't really have an understanding of what people of color experience in this country, um, there's, I think, a high probability that you might inadvertently do harm with that client that might go beyond even a microaggression. I think even Aklia mentioned earlier the idea that that client of color is doing double work um, when they come to see you. They're doing this calculation of what can I say, what will they understand, and that's a lot for the client to do as they're entering into the therapy room. Um, and I think that's another like aspect of privilege that you don't have to know the other's experience. Whereas for um, people of color, we have to have an understanding of um, the experience of white people in order to move through the world. Well, in order just to be safe, right? You've had a lot of- Absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and maybe not even even after all of that, still not safe. I, as a white person, although I don't like that label, I think it's a bit of a political label, but person that looks like me anyway, that carries privilege just by virtue of my phenotype. I, I have really been grateful for my relationships with students and colleagues of color over the years um, and for the conversations like this one that continue to just give me eyes to see. I, I yeah, I, I feel very grateful for that. And yet I'm also hesitant to ask for all the reasons of misgivings I articulated at the beginning of this conversation today that I don't want to 
push people to educate me. Um, and yet at the same time, uh, I know I don't know. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a very, uh, we live in interesting times, tragic, terrible, and yet they are, um, I guess, ripe for our growth. I hope maybe I'm spinning that a little bit. It looks like uh, Algernon, he, we still have his lovely picture, but we, uh, we don't have him. I hope he's able to join us back again. But we're coming to a close anyway. I, I did want to um, kind of get Aquia and Rochelle, could you just comment a bit about your own development as therapists? And I mean, I'm, Algernon and I were both complimenting you on your graciousness. Uh, I'm sure that's born of adversity. I, I just, I, I know it. And we've kind of talked around that. But I, I wonder if you could just, even as we close today, address a little bit more about your development and the role that race played in how you became the therapist and the persons that, that you are. Welcome back, Algernon. Hey, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> um yeah I, I think that i have um often had to make a case for um why i wanted to go into psychology i think in within my family and community um initially <laughs> right that there are a lot of stereotypes about mental health also within the black community and so for me being able to make space for this language was one where I had to really kind of stand by myself for a great period of time, um, not really seeing another person or a mental health practitioner that looks like me, maybe seeing one or two. Um, <clears throat> and so really believing that it was important, I think was a part of my development. But then also um, what I think is really a part of, a part of the question you asked, which are next steps, was um, there were always people along the journey that amplified my voice, mm -hmm. right? There were always people along the journey, including Gwen White, that really made space for my personhood, my perspective, my view, um, and, and, and in many ways helped put me in places that maybe me in and of myself, I would not have been able to put myself. Mm. And so um, when, I, when I say that a part of the work is a part of developing um, black minds and perspectives um, as it pertains to just access, mm. it's so important, <laughs> right? It's so important. Um, this conversation today is really important that as we're developing, we can push ourselves as far as we'd like to, but in some way, access is still required. Mm. Mm. Access to the table, access to conversations is still required. And so, um, again, throughout my development, there have always been people along the way that really helped me to um, see this part of myself as valid how I can actually utilize it for the community that I come from, and then also giving me access to envir educational spaces, mm -hmm. right? Conversations, boards, all of these things. We really need access and to be heard. And so I think that's a part of development, but that's also a part of next steps. Mm. Thank you. We're about to close here, Algernon, Rochelle, do you want to add anything else? That was, I think, a fitting speech that you just gave us a quiz. <laughs> that was helpful, really yeah. lovely. But yeah, Rochelle, Algernon, closing ideas, thoughts? Well, in terms of my development as a therapist, I think I would just underscore what Aquia shared. Um, being raised in the Black community and then in particularly in the Black church, um, stigma about mental health and about seeking treatment to deal with racial trauma, but all sorts of trauma. I think that's been a driving force um, 
in making me into the clinician that I am today. Mm. I will just jump in and say, especially when I'm dealing with, um, with, with Black Christians who know my pastoral background, and so they come in quoting Bible verses and talking about the will of God and that sort of thing. I want to make sure we're not going into spiritual bypass right away. So I want to clear up, hey, that's, that's probably talk for your pastor that might be more appropriate there. Because what we're gonna do here is a different, kind of, <laughs> a different kind of spirituality. And I think, you know, part of my development has been being able to say there is value and, and deep value in my faith and the faith of my clients, but there's also added value in, in what we bring to the table in terms of our psychological and emotional work. But it's, I would say equally as important. Because God cares about all our parts. Mm. God cares about all our parts, all our colors, all that we are. Thank you so much for this time today. Thanks, Wynn. Appreciate it. And just a word to our, our viewers. We're grateful that you've been a part of this in the ways you have. And uh, we're trusting that God uses this for good beyond our ability to see it. We will trust in that. So blessings to all. Take care. Bye-bye.